So, I'm finally back to my regular recording schedule, I'm at home, my editor's at home, and I have no plans of leaving my home for any extended period of time, for a long period of time. Which means, we got some catching up to do. So as the majority of you know, a couple of days ago, Chapter 401 of Hunter x Hunter released. And actually, by the time this video's out, Chapter 402 of Hunter x Hunter may have released. Now, prior to these manga chapters releasing, I should have released this video right here. But life got on top of me, and therefore, we're releasing this video now now so thanks for watching it and even though we are releasing this video late i believe that there's probably a large contingent of you out there who tried to read chapter 401 or even possibly tried to read chapter 402 and are kind of lost in what's going on in hunter x hunter right now and genuinely i can't say i blame you the succession contest arc is not only nothing like the hunter x hunter of old but it is probably the most information dense part of hunter x hunter by far and considering the fact that the majority of that information density is revolving around characters that we didn't know until about 60 chapters ago jump Jumping back into this manga cold is a bit of a flash bomb. So today, I want to run you back up on everything you need to know about Hunter x Hunter's manga before you dive back in. That is to say, today I want to run you through everything that happened between chapters 390 and 400, the 10 chapters that broke the previous hiatus two years ago. Now, the reason that I want to run you through chapters 390 to 400 is because I've already done a video breaking down the entirety of the Succession Contest arc. However, I released that video prior to the release of chapters 390 to 400 to get people caught up on the succession contest arc so they'd be ready for those chapters so if you want general information about the succession contest arc go ahead and watch that video and after you're done watching that video watch this video and then go watch my breakdown of chapter 401 and boom you'll be caught up yeah i understand it's a lot of videos i apologize but it's a dense arc but with no further ado let's get directly into everything you need to know before diving back into hunter hunter's manga but before we get to catching you up on everything you need to know guys please for me like this video subscribe to the page and hit that noti bell and if you want to see me try to bring real life challenges to the anime world go ahead and follow the brand new channel that i created with Stephen heat chris barnett and danny mata called anime irl or if you want to hear me talk anime and manga go ahead and follow my anime podcast Taku's anonymous where me and danny mata break down everything that happened to anime and manga this week it's available on youtube spotify and apple podcasts but before we get into all that today we're going to talk about our favorite recurring sponsor to the page Fume. Fume is an industry leader in the flavored air category and is quickly becoming one of the leading alternatives to smoking and vaping. It's kickstarting a whole new movement towards better habits. But how and why? Well, Fume is an award-winning flavored air device that draws flavor to your mouth. It helps fill the void that ditching a bad habit can leave, giving you something to reach for. But it's not a vape. There's no vapor which means you can use it anywhere. And there's no nicotine, which means it's non-habit forming. All you gotta do is take one of these flavor cores, slip it into your fume, put this wooden piece over it, and boom, you're ready to go with flavored air of tons of different flavors. Oh, that's good, maple pepper. And all of the flavors are non-toxic, so it's all guilt-free. On top of that, as fume is powered by your breath, there's no batteries, so nothing to charge. On top of that, it's metal and wood design, looks awesome and gives it weight, so it's fun to fidget with. It's got magnets in it, which make it fun to slip up and down, and it's got this little salt pepper twister thing that allows you to control how much air comes in and out of it. Fume has served over 300,000 customers, and you can be the next accessory they serve. For a limited time, use my code WEEB to get your free topper. It's the perfect accessory for your fume. All you have to do is slip it on the mouthpiece for a softer, warmer feel. It's chewable for those who love the fidget, and it's reusable. So head to tryfume.com, that's T-R-Y-F-U-M.com, and use code WEEB, or scan the QR code on screen right now to get your free fume topper today with purchase of the journey pack so what do we say folks it's about time we start kicking those bad habits so hunter hunter is back and you don't remember any of the names or why these faces are doing the things they're doing yeah Welcome to the club. See, objectively, the biggest issue with Hunter x Hunter is that Togashi, the mangaka of Hunter x Hunter, got to a point that could have been the ending of Hunter x Hunter, but decided, no, we gotta get to the Dark Continent, and then started to get plagued by back issues that didn't allow him to draw or write his manga any longer. And now the Hunter x Hunter manga is stuck in a real weird spot where the entirety of the important characters outside of Gon and Killua are on a black whale traveling towards the New Continent and or the Dark Continent, depending on who they are, and this travels 
section, which is known as the Succession Contest arc, has become one of the deepest, most political, and confusing arcs in the entirety of Hunter x Hunter. See, because while other mangakas would have elected to skip over the travel segment of this story and just have the Black Whale appear at the New Continent or the Dark Continent, Tagashi has decided to dedicate 50 to 60 chapters already to just the travel. But because we're dedicating so much time to the travel, we're introducing new characters to the manga, like the Haile family, the Shar'ar family, the Shiyu family, the Kakin princes, Beyond Netero, King Nasubi, all of the legally married wives, and on top of this, all of the 12 Zodiacs, the Phantom Troops, and basically anybody that Kurapika has ever interfaced with throughout the entirety of Hunter x Hunter's manga is on this boat. And considering the fact that we only get new chapters for this manga every two or so years, keeping all the information in our heads for two or so years is damn near impossible. And thus today, we're going to work our way from chapter 391 to 400, the chapters that were released two years ago in October of 2022. And while I could go page by page and break down these chapters like I do a manga review 10 times over, that would be a several hour video. And so we're going to deal in some slightly broad sweeps. So let's first introduce the major players of these 10 chapters. See, the majority, though not all of these chapters, revolve around trying to take out the Haile family, a criminal organization led by a woman by the name of Morena, a bastard child of King Nasubi who is backed by the fourth prince, Tessierdich. Now, Morena has not only a very interesting, but also very dangerous Nen technique that allows her to, upon swapping saliva with somebody, to place them in a leveling system of sorts. Now, this leveling system dictates that after you swap saliva with Morena, if you kill somebody, you gain a level. If you kill a Nen user, you gain 10 levels. And if you kill a Prince of Kakin, you gain 50 levels. Now, the reason that one would want to gain levels and therefore kill a bunch of people is because at level 21, the player will We'll call them awakes to a Nen technique. Ties into the fact that basically everybody in the Hylee family is already a serial killer and the motivation to kill people in the Black Whale is doubled. On top of this, should anybody ever become a level 100, they become what is known as a zero, which means they are allowed to swap their spit with other people and initiate them into the leveling program. Now, this isn't necessarily something that we have to be worried about right now, as Morena herself is only a level 45. However, if one of the Hylee family were able to kill one of the Kakin princes, they would become drastically closer to becoming a zero. And this essentially infectious disease of a leveling system that allows for serial killers to get superpowers would get that much closer to becoming a mass catastrophe. Now, just because the Haile family are a bad gang from the Kakin Empire doesn't mean that all gangs are necessarily bad in the Kakin Empire. As the other two major gangs on the Black Whale, the Shar'ar family and the Shiyu family, are working together with the Phantom Troop to not only try to take out the Haile family, but also find Hisuka. And they're trying to do these two separate tasks for basically the same reasons. See, basically all gangs in the Kakin Empire heavily revolve around the idea of balance. And the Haile family is currently throwing this balance that the gangs have spent decades trying to manufacture to the wind. And the Shar'ar and Shiyu families are trying to work together to re establish this balance. And the reason that they want to catch Isoka is because both the Shar'ar family and the Shiyu families would like to be able to control the Phantom Troop. Because they understand that the second that the Phantom Troop finds Hisoka, the Phantom Troop will begin to do what they entered the Black Whale to do in the first place, rob the Kakin Empire royal family. And thus the Shiyu and Shar'ar families believe that if they're able to get to Hisoka before the Phantom Troop, they would be able to stop the Phantom Troop from sowing chaos on the Black Whale and once again throwing the balance of the gang families out of control. Now the Shiyu family is led by a man by the name of Anor Longbow. Both the leaders of the Shiyu family and the Shar'ar family are food puns, and I don't necessarily understand why. But Onin or Onin, uh, it's O N I O R Onin o Onior Onior. I'm gonna call him Longbow. Longbow is a supremely powerful man, mostly because he's a half sibling to King Nasubi. Now, directly under Longbow is a character who's become kind of a main character in this story, Henry. 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 I also don't know how to say it. H I N R I G H. Ha, ha, Hen Henry? I'm gonna call him Henry. Henry is a conjurer who is the underboss of the Shiyu family, and his technique allows him to turn objects into animals. However, the animals retain the original functions of the objects. So Henry has the ability to turn this phone into something like a 
pigeon. The pigeon can then fly after Henry and take photos or make phone calls whenever he wants. This, in essence, is a really good way to disguise things like weapons or tools and makes Henry a very capable and very powerful fighter. Now, the Shiyu family, like all of the major gang families in the Kakin Empire, is backed by a prince. And the prince that the Shiyu family is backed by is Zhang, the second prince, the one with the coin-based Nen ability. Now, there's also some other key players that we get introduced to from the Shiyu family, like Zakura and Lynch, as Zakura and Lynch get told by Henry to go look for Hisuka. Zakura is a manipulator, and the thing that he manipulates is his blood. Well, Lynch has an ability that if she asks somebody a question and punches them, she's able to punch the answer out of wherever she punched, making her pretty much the perfect interrogation asset. But enough about the Shiyu family. Let's talk about the real antagonists of the 10 chapters that Togashi released two years ago, the Haile family. As it currently exists, there is 23 members of the Haile family. And like I established earlier, the Haile family was backed by Tessie Erdnich. However, it is no longer backed by Tessie Erdnich. Now, Tessie Erdnich backs Morena because Morena is a half-sister to him. King Nasubi is her father. It also makes sense that Tessie Erdnich would back Morena because Tessie Erdnich is the most evil out of all of the Kakian princes. And that's a bad thing when you consider the fact that his Nen ability that he recently awoke to is one of the most dangerous Nen abilities we've ever seen in Hunter x Hunter. As Tessie Erdnich awoke to a Nen ability that allowed him to, whenever he enacted Zetsu on himself, to see into the future. Meaning Tessie Erdnich is the first person that we've ever seen in Hunter x Hunter with future sight. And while that wouldn't be the worst thing if somebody like Karapika, Gon, or Kilua was given the ability, Tessie Erdnich is essentially Patrick Bateman. He's an attractive billionaire who uses his power and prestige to murder people. But since we're sitting here talking about the princes, let's actually quickly go over all the princes and tell you who they are, what they stand for, and where they lie in the moral spectrum. And since there is 14 princes, let's start with the first and work to the last. Benjamin is the first prince and probably started the Secession Contest arc as the strongest prince. See, Benjamin is a career soldier. He's a militaristic authoritarian. He was one of the few princes of Kakin who going into the Secession Contest arc not only knew about Nen, but also had access to it. He is the first son of the first queen and therefore from the confines of the Secession Contest arc is in the most favorable position outside of Zhang, who is the fourth prince and and the second child of the first queen. And for those of you who don't remember, the Secession Contest arc is specifically built so that children of earlier queens have an advantage over children of later queens, as children of the first queen are able to place their guards on the protection details of children from the second queen, third queen, fourth queen, fifth queen, sixth queen, and seventh queen, and eighth queen. Yes, there's eight queens. And therefore, children from an earlier queen will always be able to place their guards on the protection details of princes from a later queen. And thus, there's only two people in the entirety of the Secession Contest who aren't able to have guards from other princes assigned to them, and that would be Benjamin and Zhang. Now, this places Prince Wapple, who is the 14th prince from the 8th queen, in the worst position because every other prince is able to assign guards to keep an eye on Wapple. The second prince is Camilla. And while, once again, you must be thinking, oh, she's the second prince, she must be in the second highest position of power, no. See, Camilla was born from the second queen, so technically Zhang, who is the fourth prince, but born from the first queen is in a more advantageous situation than Camilla. Camilla is evil, but considerate. She cares for the people around her, and while she's not a pacifist, she doesn't revel in murder. She also, like Benjamin, has access to a Nen ability. However, her Nen ability is unpleasant and very conditional. See, Camilla's Nen ability is only ever activated if she herself is killed, and therefore upon being killed, Camilla is able to activate post-mortem Nen, and her ability upon the activation of her post-mortem Nen conjures a gigantic black cat that the person who killed her can't see that squishes them and uses the life force squished out of that person to bring Camilla back to life. And therefore, Camilla is essentially unkillable. But that doesn't mean her net ability is all powerful. You can just capture her, and if you capture her, she's kind of useless. But she is, for all intents and purposes, unkillable. Oh, I'm sorry. I just re-looked at my graphic. Zhang is the third prince and from the third queen. Tessie Erdnich is the fourth prince who's from the first queen. So Tessie Erdnich Nitch and Benjamin are in the best possible situations, while Zhang is actually not in that great of a situation because Tessie Erdnich, Benjamin, and Camilla are all able to place guards on his protection detail. But that brings us to Zhang, who is the third prince from the third queen. Now, Zhang is boring, 
but practical, and that's kind of his entire characterization. See, Zhang doesn't have a Nen ability, but he does have a Nen Beast, like all the other Kakin princes. And his Nen Beast creates coins that Zhang can pass out to his followers, and slowly over time, those coins vest in value, which eventually awakens the person he gave that coin to a Nen ability. Now, as it currently stands within the confines of the Succession Contest, this isn't doing anything for Zhang. And that's kind of Zhang's problem, that he's always thinking about when he'll get the throne and not how to get it. He's not a bad person, but he's just kind of boring. But you know who isn't boring? Tessie Erdnich, the fourth prince from the first queen. We kind of already touched on everything we need to touch on Tessie Erdnich. He's Patrick Bateman. He can see into the future by enacting Zetsu. And that's uh, that, that that's basically everything you need to know. He's the bad guy. Which brings us to our fifth prince, who's actually becoming a very important prince in the succession contest as of chapter 401, Tubepa. Now, Tubepa was born from the second queen and is probably the most logical and discerning out of all of the princes with the possible exception of Halkenberg. Now, Tubepa also does not have access to a Nen ability. However, Tubepa's Nen Beast has the ability to formulate and create all possible drugs she would ever need. Now, this is because the Nen Beast is a reflection of the person that they're protecting, and Tubepa is a scientist, and also a pacifist. Tubepa is actively trying to, with the help of Karapika, stalemate the succession contest. So when the Black Whale gets to the new continent, there'll simply be a vote to see who's king, as opposed to all of the princes slowly but surely eradicating each other until there's only one left. She's practical, patient, and well-mannered, and absolutely hates those who are not. But hate is not a word in the vernacular of our next prince because our next prince is Tyson, the sixth prince. I can't say the word sixth. Now, Tyson was born from the fourth queen and is therefore in the worst position out of any of the princes we've talked about thus far. Tyson is a cult leader for all intents and purposes. Tyson is the author of a book all about how love overcomes everything and how you need to let love into your heart. And back in the Kakian Empire, she leads what is essentially a cult based off the teachings of this book. And therefore, Tyson's Nen Beast manifests an ability tied to this book. You see, Tyson's Nen Beast placed a little monster type thing on the shoulder of everybody she gives a book to. And depending how far they get into her book and how much love they let into their heart, the monster placed on their shoulder gives that person a proportional amount of power. And therefore, essentially, the more dug into the cult light thinking of Tyson a person gets, the stronger they get, which is kind of wild so far as abilities go, because it means the more faithful the person gets to Tyson, the stronger they get. But enough about Tyson, let's talk about the seventh prince, Luzerus. He is the key benefactor of the Cha'ar family. I'm just now realizing I've been saying Char-ar, it's Cha'ar. And that's, uh... That's everything you need to know about Luzerus. The younger the princes get, the less relevant they get. And in no case is that more pertinent than Sale Sali, the eighth prince, who's... dead. So... Don't worry about him. But after Sully Sully, we got Hulkenberg. Now, Hulkenberg is my favorite prince. He's a pacifist who, like Tubepa, doesn't want to continue in the secession contest. He wants to, like a democratically elected leader, make a run at being elected as the next king. And therefore, his goal is the same as Karapika and Tubepa's, stalemate. He has an ability that allows him to fire what is known as a possession arrow, a technique that allows him to fire through all defenses, be they Nen or physical, that allows him to swap the consciousnesses of one of his guards into somebody else's body, allowing him to essentially have the ability to take over anybody's body he wants with somebody who is faithful to him. And because his ability is so incredibly powerful, he's got a target on his back from basically all the other princes. Though, because of his ability, no other princes have decided to place members of their guards on his guard detail. Now, princes 10 through 13 are kind of irrelevant. Kacho's dead, Fugetsu's awoken to a Nen technique that's slowly eating her alive, but Mose is dead, and Mariam is a child. Which brings brings us to our 14th and final prince, Wobble. Now, Wobble is in the worst position in the Secession Contest. As the only child of the 8th Queen, every other prince is able to assign guards to Wobble's guard duty. And this is the guard duty that Karapika pulled. And thus, Karapika, who's simply trying to allow for Queen Oito and Prince Wobble to survive through the Secession Contest, is trying his best to stalemate the Secession Contest for as long as possible so that this baby doesn't have to die so somebody else can be king. Which is why Karapika's crafted up ideas like awakening the guards of other princes to Nen, doing a two-week-long Nen and teaching course in a myriad of other ways to make room 1014 as publicly seen as possible so nobody ever has an opportunity to kill Prince Wobble. But still, Karapika is not in an advantageous situation. He has two guards from Zhang applied to his guard detail, one from Benjamin and one from Camilla. Ties into the fact that Bill, who's effectively Karapika's right-hand man in guarding Prince Wobble, ties his allegiances back to beyond Netero. And Karapika is kind of surrounded on all sides by enemies who would absolutely kill this baby to make sure that their prince be 
becomes the next king of the Kakin Empire. But anyways, enough about princes. Back to the Haley family and the Phantom Troop because that's really what chapters 391 to 400 are about. Hisoka is found in chapter 392, specifically by Zakura and Lynch. And thus, the Shiyu family knows exactly where Hisoka is on the ship and could pass that information along to the Phantom Troop whenever they want. However, they don't want to pass that information on to the Phantom Troop. And in actuality, Henry goes to Hisoka, who's watching a movie, and says, listen, both you and or the Phantom Troop could wipe out the entire entirety of our gang in an instant so please we don't want to be your enemy because we're currently allying with the phantom troop so please don't fight against the phantom troop until we're done allying ourselves with them and thus the shiyu family is trying to stoke as much peace as possible on the black whale until the shiyu family is no longer allied with the phantom troop that is to say until the Haley family is destroyed and the shiyu family has some pretty strong motivation for trying to wipe out the Haley family see because like we already established the shiyu and cha'ar families are trying to wipe out the Haley family because they're trying to upset the balance of the gang's association in the Kakin Empire and what will eventually become the gang's association of the new continent or the dark continent. But the reason that the Haley family is actually trying to disrupt this balance is because the Haley family wants the Hunter Association and the government to realize that the best way to protect the princes in their succession contest is to kill all gangs. And thus the Haley family is trying to disintegrate as much faith as the government has in the gangs of the Kakin Empire as possible by doing things that fundamentally break Yakuza rules like killing civilians or not registering their gang members in the passenger logs of the Black Whale. But you're probably asking the question, Nick, how are the combined forces of the Phantom Troop and two gangs not enough to wipe out one gang? Well, it's not like the Haley family are wildly powerful and the Phantom Troop couldn't take them out if they tried. It's that the Haley family has a couple of Nen users who have very interesting and very frustrating Nen abilities. Like the Admitter, who's a part of the Haley family, who has the ability to create doors that transport you to a different location once you walk through them. Which allows for the Haley family to pop around the black whale without using traditional means of transport and also makes finding them extremely difficult and thus the phantom troop the shiyu and the cha'ar family are struggling to find the Haley family's hideout but that doesn't mean that they haven't been able to wipe out some of the Haley members they absolutely have but the Haley's ability to retreat to places that the phantom troop the cha'ar and the shiyu families can't get has allowed them to survive for longer than they would have usually and that's pretty much everything you need to know about the gang war happening on the black whale at least for the moment because in chapter 359 we actually take a step off of the black whale back way into the past to see the origins of the phantom troop in the mean who well, i guess you can't really call them streets uh, trash lined alleys of meteor city see it's revealed to us almost immediately that the phantom troop weren't always friends Krolo was friends with the likes of franklin and shalnark uvigan and machi were friends finks and Feitan were friends but all of their respective groups kind of existed as child gangs that were trying to edge each other out of each other's territories and it's revealed to us that during this time period prior to meteor city aligning itself with the mafias of the v6 countries that meteor city was even more lawless than it currently is prior to meteor city becoming a essentially a breeding ground or a dumping ground for all of the gangs in the v6 countries every single year there used to be hundreds of victims of people who would go to meteor city and either kill for sport or kidnap and 70 percent of the victims of these sport killings or kidnappings were children however because of the harsh environments and the tough upbringing kids who didn't die early began to awake to nen abilities and they were able to use these nen abilities to scare off criminals and thus as the phantom troop was coming up in age meteor city City was still incredibly unsafe but safer than it used to be but now it's revealed that Krolo and Pakunoda grew up together in an orphanage basically the only building in Meteor City that also served as a church in a way that the children of Meteor City entertained themselves is that they would pour through the trash that was dumped all across their city because that's what Meteor City is a place where you can dump anything people included and try to find VHS's and one day Krolo stumbles upon a power cleaners VHS which is very clearly supposed to be the Power Rangers and since the power cleaners are massively popular with children all across the globe, this is a fantastic find. However, the VHS is in the wrong language, but it is a language that Krolo speaks. And so Krolo dubs over this VHS for all of the kids of Meteor City, recruiting his female friends to do the female voices while he does all of the male voices. And this piece of information isn't prevalent, but I like it. The mighty sweeping MC looks exactly like a mid to older teenaged gone. However, eventually, unfortunately, their power cleaner tape breaks, and the audio track for the power cleaner's VHS is is no longer usable and therefore Krolo and all of his friends who are the majority of the members of the Phantom Troop have to go out on the stage of the theater where the power cleaners VHS is being projected and act out the
the voices live for the crowd. However, none of this happens without a girl by the name of Sarasa, who is one of Krolo's oldest friends. She was the one who incentivized Uvagin to come and join Krolo in the dubbing. She brought Fix and Feitan into the mix. She recruited Machi and Pakunoda. Without her, the Phantom Troop truly never would have come together as friends in this project. And it's at this point that we learn why the Phantom Troop is called the Phantom Troop, because they wanted to be a traveling acting troop who would tour all across Meteor City and play out these power cleaner videos for the children in every corner of this hellscape. And that's what they do for a fair amount of time until one day they're trying to dub over new videos and Sarasa doesn't show up. See, little did they know, Sarasa knew of a place in Meteor City where a bunch of VHSs had been dumped, and thus she was trying to surprise Krolo with the new Power Cleaners VHS, but while she was on her way to that area, a group of men kidnap her. And thus, even though an entire theater of children are waiting for an episode of Power Cleaners dubbed by the Phantom Troop, Krolo tells them that because Sarasa, the voice of the Orange Ranger, isn't there, that they're gonna have to postpone their showing. But in that moment, the entirety of the crowd decides to help the Phantom Troop go look for Sarasa. But even though Krolo has galvanized hundreds of children to go look for Sarasa, he blames himself for her not being there, as he knew that there was an uptick in kidnappings recently, and he never should have let her be alone. And this guilt only gets worse when the Phantom Troop, after a couple of hours of looking, stumbles upon a bag pulled up into a tree. And at the base of this tree, there is a note in a language that only Krolo reads. And when they cut down the bag and open it, they find Sarasa's corpse with another note nailed to its forehead. And once again, a language that only Krolo reads. And while the entire troop begs Krolo to tell them what this note says, he refuses. But you can see this moment shakes not only Krolo, but the entire Phantom Troop to their core. A child who was the singular bright spot in the trash hellscape that was Meteor City was killed and disfigured for no real reason. And the Sarasa's body is brought back to the church and put back together so that a funeral can be held in her honor. However, she's not put back together in a standard kind of embalming, morticianer kind of way. There's a mysterious woman by the name of Renko who's introduced here, and apparently Renko uses her Nen technique to put Sarasa's body back together. Now, this is incredibly interesting because Sarasa, while in her casket, looks exactly like a young version of Morena, the head of the Haile family. And considering the fact that the Phantom Troop is actively trying to destroy the Haley family, I feel a theory cooking. This becomes doubly suspicious when you consider the fact that Renko is the person who teaches Machi basically everything she knows. And Machi was able to do things like reattach Hisoka's arms with perfect function. But regardless of whether or not Sarasa actually survives, this moment enacts a permanent change in Krolo. As Krolo, after Sarasa's funeral, asks the Phantom Troop to follow him with the distinct motivation of finding her murderer as he tells them that he's going to make Meteor City a safe haven for criminals so that criminals who possibly could have been responsible for Sarasa's murder will come to Meteor City and the Phantom Troop will be able to vet them to see if they're the murderer the Phantom Troop is looking for. But to do this, Krolo lets the Phantom Troop know that he has to become a villain of ages, a true force of evil strong enough to destroy other strong forces of evil. And thus, the Phantom Troop is born. Chapter 399 and 400 then return back to the Black Whale, where Nobunaga and Henry eventually do enough detective work that they're able to stumble upon the Haley headquarters. However, because of a couple of very impressive Nen abilities, Henry and Nobunaga aren't able to storm the headquarters in the way that they would have wanted to. However, Henry did turn a tracking device into an oyster and swallowed it before going to the headquarters, because he knew even if he was killed in the headquarters, the Phantom Troop would be able to follow the tracking oyster in his stomach. However, as Nobunaga and Henry are being escorted out of the HQ by a shady lawyer's Nen ability that allows him to make an immortal army of of robots, Henry is able to regurgitate the oyster and cast it into the HQ, which will allow for Finks and Feitan to find the HQ using the tracking device. And with all of that, we are now back at chapter 401, which I did a breakdown of a couple of days ago, so if you want to hear what happened in that chapter and what it could possibly mean for the future of Hunter x Hunter, go and watch that video now. And between my Succession Contest arc explained video, this video, and the chapter 401 explained video, you will be caught up with Hunter x Hunter. But if you guys have any other questions or feel as though some things are still massively confusing tell me in the comments below and while you guys are down there please for me like this video subscribe to the page and hit that noti bell hope you guys are ready for this to become a hunter hunter page because that's what you're getting